Well, good afternoon, everyone. And as Rachel stated, we are recording this session. And if you are a professional working with socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, you're in the right place. Our session today is for strategies for farm bill opportunities. Uh, my name is Sam Cook. I'm a forester, been in the business over 35 years. I work here at NC State in the College of Natural Resources. I'm also serving as the Vice President of our Natural Resources Foundation, private consultant on the land of, as a registered forester and a USDA technical service provider. Don't wanna spend time talking about the conservation organ forestry organization, but I do enjoy representing the forestry and the conservation community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gray. Okay. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, that's my picture you see there. I am uh, Gregory Goins. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Design. And this is something that we are passionate here at a and as the largest uh, black historically uh, college in the nation. And we have a, just a phenomenal lineup of activities and uh, presentations for you today. Okay. So without further ado, I'll um, right, send it to Dr. Sharma next. Good afternoon, everyone. My oh. name is Harmandeep Sharma. I'm an adjunct faculty at NC a &T University, and I'm a plant physiological ecologist by training, and my research interest involves looking at water management using agricultural sensors. So today you will listen to me that I'm gonna talk and share my experience working with agricultural sensors. And next, Dr. Bomik. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Arnab Bomik. I'm an assistant professor in uh, soil science and soil microbiology in uh, the same department. And my research expertise is in looking into biological soil health, uh, so different uh, nutrient cycling processes, uh, you know, best management practices, and greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll be presenting some of uh, my research today. Thank you. Dr. Gale. So, so next we have Dr. Gale, if he unmutes. Well, let's see. Yeah, while Dr. Gill is uh, going ahead, Dr. Yaboa, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Osei Yaboa, professor and director of the L.C. Cooper International Trade Center, which is the only center of excellence of, uh, for international trade among the 1890s. And we are also center of excellence for small farms since 2005. So. I work with uh, a lot of socially disadvantaged producers across the country uh, through USD grant, SSDGG, and now OPP uh, several times to help these farmers on all areas, economics, marketing, and the rest, and our partners like Dr. Gale, who will pick you up for irrigation and soil issues. So glad to be here. Thank you, sir. Dr. Gale? Yes, um, Godfrey Gale, I'm former chair of this department, Natural Resources and Environmental Design. Now I'm um, pro pro Professor Emeritus. My background is in soil and water management, uh, irrigation, drainage. I also work with Dr. Yaboa and um, disadvantaged um, farmers or um, what we call socially disadvantaged producers. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of my colleagues here on the presentation today. Um, as I stated earlier, you're in the right place if you work with socially disadvantaged farmers, ranchers, and veterans. Our program today, we would look forward to you learning and understanding the barriers faced by historically underserved landowners. Also, provide an opportunity to see access cutting edge research through the 1890s and the 1862 land grant university. We hope you gain resources to empower the small scale farmers within the new, with new approaches, also to increase production efficiency at minimal cost. Some of the topics that we'll cover today is the importance of soil and water management and crop production, methods for efficient water use, 
ways to promote water, soil, health management, and how technologies can increase efficiency. How to efficiently meet production while being stewards of the land. But most importantly, we're going to spread the this training. Let me hit you back. Can you oh, please mute? So most importantly, a big portion of today, which is part of my presentation, we're going to get into the farm bill, land usage, uh, how we have programs working out that are demonstrating what the opportunities are for small scale landowners. And a biggest part of it is somewhat on the conservation easements as it relates to USDA. As I stated, I am the executive director of forest assets and youth here at NC State. My topic is land utilization and heirs property. But I want to make sure that you understand our outline for this session. It includes what is our property, how it, who, who is affected by it, and how does it occur. We get into the Uniform Petition Act, the 2018 Farm Bill, which is also the relending program and the farm number provision for heirs property. We'll talk about what it means to get a farm number. The importance of NRCS, which is the Natural Resource Conservation Services under USDA and their programs as it relates to air property and the farm number and people that have clear title that are required that shows eligibility. Programs that air property owners are also eligible due to a clouded title and we'll get into that. We'll spend some time on ec ecological impact slash natural resource management which says sustainable forestry and land retention programs. That's eight in existence now. We'll look at an asset map, show you how you can use this type process in your community experiences working with heirs owners as they apply, but also the USDA NRCS and FSA programs. We'll leave you with other resources and talk about the historically underserved working group, the Office of Partnership and Public Engagement Program, and have a little bit of time for questions and, that, and uh, spend some time talking about it. There's a lot of slides that you'll see us go through here today. The most important for you to take away we're providing you a tool uh, here, so we're not going to address every single slide, but these slides will be posted on Mississippi State's web landing page. Also, we'll have leave the talking notes with the with them, so you will have a toolkit that you can take back to your community and work with your landowners to ensure that what we provide to you is, can be used within your your area. So, quick overview. Harris property is prevalent along many people, especially in the African American community and especially in the Black Belt of the South. It's also in Appalachia, the Central Appalachian, and the, and the Caucasians. Hispanic Americans deal with the problem, also in US Western colonial communities. Native Americans deal with it. It's fractionate ownership, it's similar. It refers to real property inherited without a will, but is limited to allotments on tribal land. It occurs throughout the United States. So without a deed, the heirs cannot sell or develop the land. They cannot participate in state or federal funded programs. And most times they're at risk of losing their property altogether. Now, I did state earlier that we're gonna talk about programs and services that our property owners can qualify for. But prior to this farm bill, the newest one that started in 2018, our property owners had a hard time getting eligible to apply for farm for, uh, USDA programs, especially as it relates to NRCS. So a little snapshot on economic loss. In a 2017 report with the Forest Service and the Federal Reserve of Atlanta, they estimated that there are more than 1.6 million acres of air property in the counties. And that's comprised the Black Belt, valued at more than $6.6 .6 billion. So for the largest southern region, as you look at Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia, that's an estimate of what 3.5 million acres with an access value of $228 billion. That's a lot of land tied up that one, landowners cannot get economic wealth, nor do they get to benefit like us with traditional land ownership without having to jump through hoops. And typically, it's not an asset to them. It's more of a problem. So the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta also contends that 55% of all adults and 72% of non-white adults do not have a will. 
in place, which leads to uh, future area of property generation. So if you don't take anything away from this thing, from this uh, workshop today, make sure you, your family, and others around you get a wheel. Do some around this estate planning, so it's important for you to have that so all your assets can be passed down properly. African American land ownership peaked in 1910 at around 15, really up to close to 19 million acres. So whether land owned by heirs is lost through a sale or an abandonment, success for successful generations are unable to reap the benefits of ownership. Most times it's lost through payment probate. Wealthy land families may be able to consolidate their holdings. However, heirs that own property as tenants in common will more likely see this wealth dissipate. That's because if they don't have a will, there's many owners associated with that heir. The struggle is someone may sell and cause all the land, that, the whole property to be sold, which they can end up losing the land. This issue is pervasive among ethnic and racial minority landowners, as well as lower income, lower wealth landowners. So land, air property is land that's held with a secure title. It is also called family land. It's also an estate, deceased slash deceased at all. Those are typical <clears throat> ways that we, that we look at land that with those titles or those endings would be spared as heirs and heirs and heirs. So in it, you don't really know air property until you get on it to determine if it's not a clear title indeed. So it is a subcategory of tenants in common ownership that occurs when individuals and individual tenants in common do not own any part of their shared parcel, but instead they own a fractional interest in the, un in the whole undivided whole. So if 10 people own 10 acres, that does not mean that each one of them has an acre because you'll see in an example later on, they only have a fraction, but they are entitled to the whole. So sometimes people say, well, I pay the taxes, so I own it. That's not correct. Just because you pay the taxes, everyone else still get to reap the same benefits that you do. Heirs, owners of heirs do not own a specific portion or, or acreage, rather they own a percent of the interest is what I just stated to you earlier, based on their relationship to the original landowners. Owners are called co-tenants in common. So that's typically, when you think about the tenants in common, I had an example that I worked with an attorney under the Center for Heirs Property Preservation back in 2013. And I kept asking, why do we have this problem with air property? Why don't they just fix it? He says, they under the same law as everyone else, joint common and co-tenants in common. So what we see with our property, the title has never been cleared. So there's multiple owners still associated to that unclear title, which means in order to clear it, they have to go through a legal process to get it into the legal living owners to date. This example, I'm just going to, I'm not going to share it, but I'm going to talk, let you see it because what we want you to do is go back and study this, work on it when you get the presentation and see how it works because it is definitely something that's mind blowing to you. And air property could be young, it could be old. One of my sayings with people is when they say they don't want to clear the title, I said the more people, more kids born, the more people dying within the family creates a bigger problem. So waiting does not resolve the problem, it makes the problem worse. Lack of a no plan means you can produce air property. So whether you own an acre or a lot, make sure you pass either one of those down, especially if it's large land ownership. Avoid family conflict. Who in here get along with their family? <laughs> not many of us. For those that do still try maintain that relationship, most importantly, if it's around whatever you own, make sure that you all talk about it, make sure that it's in a wheel, make sure that you pass it down the right way. You don't always have to give, if you have more than one child, you don't have to give that to all the children in a share. Find a way that you can make sure that they are not fighting when you leave this space. You write out a plan, which is a wheel, 
create an LLC or a trust. These are two options, two to three options that are very critical to you when it comes down to passing down your land in the right way. So make sure that you as a family start today, talk about what you own, put it on paper, work with an attorney, and record it in the court. So impacts of air property. Air property restricts how land can be managed because typically all heirs need to agree on any decision concerning the land. That includes division of profits. For example, you do a timber harvest. That means everyone that's tied to that particular deed or ownership should get their share of the profit. They also should pay their share for the reforestation. They should also pay their share of the taxes. The mineral rights, what if you bring in income from those rights? They all have an equal share in that right. Mortgages and other loans associated with it, everyone should pay their percentage. And if we show and help you understand the USDA programs and what air property owners qualify for, including the conservation easements, you have an opportunity there to share in the wealth. But also the problem you're gonna run into with air property, conservation easements. You must have a clear title. There is no way you can get a conservation easement in today's world without clear title to the land. Because air property is unsecured, it is susceptible to loss. Because one, most folks don't want to pay the taxes. Then they look around, taxes get not paid. There's somebody waiting for you to not pay the taxes. Then once it's put on the chopping blocks to be sold, typically that person who's been waiting on it to go on the market, they buy it. Then they can turn around and either put it back on the market and sell it back to you at a percentage or more than what you what they paid for it. I think it's illegal, but there's a lot of people out there that are making a business out of that. They waiting at tax sales every time, waiting to buy up land to turn around and put it back on the market. A petition sales, individual interest can be sold. So let's assume I live up north. I'm a part owner of 500 acres down in South Carolina. Somebody approached me and said, I want to buy your share. If I don't know that I own it, I really may not know what it's worth. But also the money may look, sound good and I need it right there. So we'll work up a, a deal, buy the, sell the land, I'll get the money. Now this person who purchased the land, do you think they wanna come spend time with you at the family reunion? No, their intent <laughs> is to get in, to be part of the family so they can find a way to keep buying out more shares. In that way, they can possibly force the share force a sale, which means it could go on the market without anyone else uh, where you may not be able to pay for it in the long run. From non-payment of taxes, taxes are due typically in October, delinquent after December 31st, tax sales in April. Auction, as I stated earlier, goes to the highest billing, three years on the property land in the house, up to three years. This is just an example in Alabama. Each state has different laws. so. Don't take this as the gospel to go back and say, this is what I'm, what's happening in my state, but just see this as an example. So find out what's happening in your state as it relates to non-payment of tax. So for results of owning their property, for the individual, it could be a loss in investment value and a loss of potential revenue. So if I don't have a deed, I probably can't put a house on it without going to some scrupulous box uh, mortgage person. Or typically you see air property where a lot of trailers or mobile homes sitting on the property. And that means that they're not able to get a loan for it. it but it also brings down your tax value and it's depreciation. So unpaid taxes cause the property to depreciate, which can also cause communities to be abandoned or seen as a blight. So helping landowners to try to see the value of improving their land by making sure they can clear their title it will help them, one, to have borrowing capacity. They can do more with the land and they can impact the land, appreciate more. So issues with our property are dependent on two factors. Your relationship with the owner, original owner, for example, son, daughter is close, closer more than the nephew or niece. 
how many generations have passed since the original, or for example, a son, a daughter, it's closer, uh, then a grandson or a granddaughter. In general, the longer you wait from the original owner of the more potential heirs, the smaller the share from the original piece of the property. So on a project I did back in 2013 to 2016, we were out identifying landowners who would take advantage of what we call, what we call sustainable forestry. Few of the landowners that we engaged with, they had their property. There was one family <laughs> that had two sets of families that they were divided. They were not talking to each other, but they had family members on each leg of the air properties. And so they had like 200 acres each. One family was looking to resolve the air property. The other family wanted to maintain their air, maintain it in their property. One, one that same family that wanted to maintain it as their property, they put the timber up for sale. They decided they wanted to reforestate. They also did not want to split the money. Finally convinced them to do that. But guess how many family members was associated with all of this? Up to 400 individuals that were considered legal heirs of this property, of both properties. So you recall there was a 40 acre you know, mule concept back in post-slavery in over 50, 155 years from the Civil War. That's how far back this air property example will take you. And that's how many generations that'll be impacted. So there are some places that still have the title and the deceased person's name all the way back into the 18 and 1900s. So guess there, think about how many land, how many people are associated with that that have a share or some equivalent uh, uh, value tied to that land. One of the most important things is getting the families together to talk about how do they make the division and who can help them resolve that title issue. This example will be in the work on your workbook when we're done, um, spend some time going over it and making sure you understand it when you get ready to start working with your people. Is it better to use this land as an individual claiming your share or collectively as a family? I will answer that for you. Just taking, for example, the 200 people, it was almost impossible for them to figure out how to, one, get it to the legal owners to clear the title. But helping them to say, if we can manage it as a whole, any income that come in, they wanna make sure they get it back into the land. And if they had a way that they can split it or divide the rest of it, they need to do so. But trying to divide the land to make it equal is somewhat impossible when you got that many owners. That's why we encourage you to try to do this early on and start working with the families without waiting or trying to make sure that it does not become air property. Everyone take a kind of a stretch break. So it, will, it will not be for 10 minutes either. <laughs> yeah, I think we can go ahead and continue. Yeah. I'm walking into now what we call the Uniform Petition Act. Some people you will hear this referred to as UPHPA back from 2010. If you do not decide how you want to divide your state now, the state in which you reside in, which in the state which you reside in will do it for you. Death is probated in a will. So if you die, you don't have a will, the state has one way on you. Each state deals with it different. I know in one state uh, within 10 years, you must probate the estate. If not, there's a, a will waiting on you in the state that tells you this is how land must be divided and passed down. So here's an example. Say if you die with children but no spouse, children inherits everything. 
a spouse, but no descendants or parents. Spouse inherits everything. Spouse in one child or descendants of one child. The spouse inherited one half of your intestate and real child. Children, descendants inherit one half of your intestate, real estate. Spouse and parents, no children, no descendants. Spouse inherits one half of your intestate, real estate. Parents inherit one half of your intestate, real estate. Let's say parents, but no spouse or descendant. Parents inherit everything. Sibling, but no spouse, descendants or parents. Siblings inherit everything. So the Uniform Petition Act provides a series of due process protections. Notice to all other co-tenants. It talks about independent appraisers to set established fair market value. It's the right of first refusal, and if heirs do not exercise their right, and sale is a sale is required. A commercially reasonable sale supervised by the court to ensure that a fair share is given to all the tenants. So as stated, heirs' property occurs when real property is passed through intestate. Landowner dies without a will. The real property is then passed to the heirs as tenants in common under state law. This means one heir can force petition sale. Tenants in common means that they each have an undivided interest in the whole. Real estate developers have taken advantage of this and often buy exclusionary rights. Real estate developers, they buy small shares into heirs' property by buying out the tenants in common. Then they file a petition act and force a sale. By doing this, these real estate developers acquire their property at less than fair market value, since the state court mechanism is to use debitor credited sales of liquidating the asset as soon as possible. These depletes the inherited wealth and does not take intercultural ties to the land, as well as other factors, like in an heir may be rendered homeless by the sale of the land. So when the Uniform Petition Act started back in 2011, it's under, it was first established in Nevada. And Georgia was next, Montana, Alabama, Connecticut, Arkansas, Hawaii, so what, South Carolina, Hawaii in the same year, Texas, New Mexico, Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, and the Virgin Islands. So as you can see, not all states are up there. So here's a snapshot of where the Uniform Petition Act has been in play to ensure that there's lots of opportunity to pick up other states. So they're constantly looking at and trying to do something in North Carolina, Mississippi, New York, Virginia, Florida, Mississippi just came on this year. And I know there's discussion in North Carolina starting, been working on it, but we haven't passed it yet. So we got to get more support. It's been introduced in New Jersey, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Massachusetts, West Virginia, Indiana, and now Washington, D.C. In the Agriculture Improvement Act of 2018, this is public law under the 2018 Farm Bill and public law number 115-334. So FSA is the Farm Service Agent agency. So resolving barriers to participate in FSA programs. One, eligibility and how to obtain a farm number. Addressing ownership issues, air property, oh, air property relending program. So to obtain a, to obtain a farm number, one, you need to be have, you need to have ownership of the land. But the state has adopted the Uniform Petition of Heirs Property Act, which court order verified land is heir property. The certification that the recorded owner is deceased and not then and not less than one heir has started procedure to retitle the land. An executed, fully executed, unrecorded tenancy and common agreement that sets out ownership rights and responsibility among all of the owners of the land. This has been approved by a majority of the ownership interests in that property. Also has given a particular owner the right to manage and control any portion or all the land for purposes of operating the farm or ranch. And was validity validly entered into under the authority of the jurisdiction in which the land is located. So 
prior to the Farm Bill and somewhat prior to some of the Uniform Petition Act, air property owners could not get a farm and track. They did not qualify. So the Farm Bill, along with the support of the Uniform Petition Act, helped landowners that have uh, air property to qualify for that farm and track number, which is basically we treat the farm and track, farm and track number like the social security number. Because in order for you to apply for certain programs under USDA, the Natural Resource Conservation Services, you need a farm and track number. That's one of the second questions, <laughs> one of the main questions on the application. So if you check the box that you don't have a farm and track number, the application does not get processed. So in order for you to establish that farm and track number, you need a copy of the deed if it's recorded. An unrecorded deed if the specific USDA program does not require one, which means you can, uh, some places take the, uh, who pays the taxes and work with you through that process. A land purchase contract or other similar document that affirms ownership. An FSA employee checks the record at the county land records office or website, and that's how you can assign a farm and track number. The relending program. It provides revolving loan funds to eligible intermediate real land lenders to resolve ownership. Also, we're not able to say what it's going to do yet because it's still under negotiation. So I just want to make sure that you understand that they're negotiating now around what they can do to help air property based on a cheap, uh, as far as helping them resolve air property and trying to provide funding to support that. But it's still up for review. Resolving ownership and land succession. Eligible entities include those with experience in, experience in systems, uh, beginning farmers and ranchers and cooperatives and credit unions authority, authorization for an appropriation of $10 million annually. This could happen anytime between 2019 and 2023. Like I said, this is still being negotiated on the FSA. So what are some programs that you that the landowner qualify for? The Agricultural Management Assistance Program, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, Conservation Stewardship Program. Also, not only if they qualify for those, the one thing that I mentioned for air property owners that they don't qualify for is the conservation easements. So under NRCS, they have the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. It helps landowners, land trusts, and other entities protect, restore, and enhance wetlands, grasslands, and working farms and ranches through conservation easements. It is a component of NRCS that helps the American Indian tribe, the state, the local government, and non-government uh, organizations protect working agricultural lands and limit non-agricultural uses of the land. Under the wetlands reserve component, NRCS helps to restore, protect, and enroll, enhance enroll wetlands. So there's lots of benefit under the conservation easement program, but typically you must get clear title or you must have clear title to qualify for it. And so it's not out of sight, but it is an opportunity which should give you some incentive to do so. Uh, easements can be held sometimes in up to 30 years and then there are lifetime easements. If you need to prove control of the land, applicants can accept Self-certify control of land under, if it's leased or through another agreement, NRCS has a form to call it in the CPA 1200. NRCS will also verify annually that the particip participant continues to maintain control of the land until, until the contract is obligated. And all this must be done prior to the approval of any payments. <laughs> State conservationists, may waive this requirement for tribal land and other unique cases in which a written lease is not customarily used. So for more information related to that, you'll be able to seek this out in working lands conservation programs under the manual sub part C. And that way will help you identify any questions or concerns related to what how the eligibility process works. We mentioned that NRCS conservation easement program, we talked about those. So 
we, you don't qualify if you have our property, but if you do have clear title, I would work with your local USDA, NRCS, and Farm Service Agency, county agents to ensure that they can help you establish if there's funding available or if there's a way that they can help you see the importance of what you can do on your land. And those resources are, paid, are already available to you as a landowner. You do not have to go and pay them for anything. It's already taken care of for you. So this is something that's near and dear to me because in 2012, the U.S. Endowment for Forest and Communities, they approached about 17 organizations and they wanted to see if landowners would do more around improving their land using forestry as the carrot, but also trying to identify if air property one was a was a barrier to moving forward, but third, to see what ways that we can help them improve to help them see the opportunity to get clear title to the land. So in 2012, they walked, they went around and talked to several, not what I call community organizations, land grant university, and they set out, they sent out an RFP to about 17 or 18 organizations across the South. They chose four organizations and a pilot program. And they were doing this because of the extreme loss of land under the African American community. So the actual program was called the Sustainable Forestry African American Land Retention Program. We knew that landowners were losing land, as you can see from 1920, and look at where it is today present, 7 million acres, could be more or less. A lot of land that's owned by the minority community, especially in the African American community, is unmanaged land, and we call it unmanaged forest. Uh, typically, if you hear, was around when my dad was living, we helped him cut his timber. Dad, was, when I helped him do that, we, he ended up almost getting cheated out of it. So he had 33 acres. Someone offered him $3,000 at first, and he didn't take that. But a week later, someone came back and offered around $13,000. So he got happy, he found him a $2,000 truck that he was going to buy. So my mother and my brother told him that, you need to call your son. He's there in forestry school. Let him help you. So he did. I went down, a lot, helped him with a consultant to get the land, get the timber sold. He ended up getting $33,000. $33, All because he used one a professional to help him do so. They did not cheat him like the other two were planning to do. But the other thing that came along with that is I told him that we need to grow, put more trees in the ground. He says, son, they grew that way before, and God will cause them to come back again that way. <laughs> I said, I can't argue with you, but there is a way that we can help. So I went to NRCS. I worked with the Alabama Forestry Commission. They helped him apply for financial assistance program, which is what we just talked about. From that, he ended up getting enough money that he didn't have to use any of his money to get the site prep work done, to get trees in the planet, and we as a family, three sisters, three brothers, we've been managing the land and reaping the benefits off of it ever since. And it's time now for another harvest. And so we'll do the same thing, divide it, the money up, but go and reinvest in it and start passing it down to our next generation. Land becomes a burden. So people in this process, we identified that they did not want to do anything because one, like Daddy said, he it grew that way before. And typically when it grows that poorly, that means the income per acre is, is a lot less. So we helped them see the value of one, getting a new crop as quick as they can, putting a new crop in the ground, the right crop, and then ensuring that they use the right management practices to, to make it efficient for the next generation. The pilot study had to identify um, what we call solutions, and we use forestry as the carrot, as I stated earlier. Stability of the land ownership across generations. We wanted to show the landowners that we measured in this pilot study how to make, how to build family wealth, and we promoted forest retention. So, a family that I dealt with it was four sisters. They all had kids, and they were older ladies. 
I met with them one day because they heard me giving a, a presentation like I'm doing with you today. They in turn wanted to sell the timber. We helped them sell the timber, brought a consultant to also help with. They were started off trying to get about 90,000 when we first met them. They ended up with close to $290,000. We also helped them apply for the USDA programs and services. They got 90% of the money back to reinvest in the property. The other thing that came along with that is when I first met those sisters, one of the leads had her kids. She invited she had three, two sons. She wanted them to come down and meet with us at the same time. They didn't want anything to do with it because they couldn't see the value going forward. Once we cut the timber and showed them the income that USDA was providing, then I always provided a sort of a performer that tells them, here's the potential if you grow this seed stock with no, with no issues along the way. They were gonna come up with something like close to three quarters of a million dollars. Guess what? I start getting phone calls. I start meeting with the family. They got energized. The moral to that story is we need to do a better job of selling the future of what that opportunity looks like. But not only we had to spend time educating in the front end and we educated throughout the whole process. So these are the things that in the pilot study, and we'll talk about each one of them, where they are, we identified from 20 to 40 landowners with all different land with all different ownership structures to take them through a series of things for over a two-year process that we measured success or unsuccess amongst all of them. But we also brought them together once a month, educating them on the importance of doing these things the right way. Now, we didn't get all for just the area I was operating in. We chose 40 landowners. Not all 40 came along at the same time. We still have some people today that don't believe in the process and they fell out of the, that particular pilot. But the program, when we started, was in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Alabama. Now it is located in Arkansas, Mississippi, Georgia, and Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. So Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina were the first, were the pilots. Two years after that, the board for the U.S. Endowment for Forests and Communities said, we see that this is making an impact. We see that the landowners are taking advantage of it. Forestry was the right carrot, but we looked at land as land utilization. So if we're working with a landowner, we did a holistic approach by saying, if you need to farm, you can still grow trees. If you're growing trees and you have land that you want to farm, you can still do both. So when I talk about the asset map, I'll show you the different partners that we need it, that we need to, that you as an individual need to work with to help the landowners to be successful. We didn't walk into these communities saying we're here to help. We had to go into those communities to one, listen to them, explain to them what, why we were there, but also we had to build trust because people that own land, especially the people of color. We don't trust a lot of people when it comes down to talking about land and how, what they own. We don't want to go there work with government grants. So there was a fear that we had to overcome with the landowner and for ourselves. Since it worked in those three states, the other four states came on a year later. Then Texas was just brought on board this year or early, late last year. So we have eight states now operating the program with these particular organizations, like the University of Ar Arkansas, Western County Self-Help, which is a cooperative. We have a limited resource landowner group in Alabama, which is a, made up of all landowners. The Federation of Southern Cooperatives was a part of the, the pilot. The McIntosh Seed Program down in Georgia. Center for Areas Property Preservation, which is in the South Carolina region. Started in the Low Country, now they're over about 17 to 20 counties. Roanoke Electric Cooperative over here in the northeast side of the Husky in the Black Family Land Trust out of Virginia. These are landowners, people that's been trained. These are also service providers like yourself that's going to go back out and implement programs on the ground. You see a guy down there with his wife, the tree farmer. 
when I first met him, he invited me to visit his land. He came out of his house. He had a shotgun in his hand. We walked the whole property. He didn't trust me. He told me up front, I don't know who you are, why you want to be here. But we built trust together. And he did not know anything about the tree farm program. He did not know anything about forestry. He had our property, which he worked on it with his family, resolved the title issue with the family using the center's help. But most importantly, in this program, we in introduced them to the people in the communities that are already out there willing and able to help you. Like USDA, their job is to help you as a landowner understand what conservation on the ground needs to look like. Forestry Commission, they're there to help you assess your land, to help guide you to resources that you can help manage your land. There's buyers for people out there that can help one, give you the right price for your wood if you're going to sell it. There's consultants to help you manage that asset, the process. There, you don't have to do anything alone. And literally, most of the services that are available to you as a landowner are free. NRCS from USDA on a national level, they get an allotment of money every year. I can speak to North Carolina, I think like this year is probably about $29 million. All that money has to be divided up to Lyman. Uh, let's look at South Carolina, 18 to $20 million. It fluctuates every year, but landowners apply for those programs that I mentioned earlier. We help them navigate that process. We were there standing by their side, guiding them through the process and following through to ensure that what they needed was important and critical to make them successful. And we had partners. NRCS, American Forestry Foundation. The American Forestry Foundation now is leading the program. U.S. Endowment handed it to them. They, in turn, working now with the eight particular SFLR sites. Our partner starting out was the initial U.S. Endowment. It was the Forest Service and it was the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Those three entities came together with a shared set of outcomes to say, what do we need to do to make the landowner successful? And they found the right organizations within communities to make the project work. So I mentioned something about an asset now. If you in your community and you wanna build out a program such as what I just described, you start in the center box and that becomes who you are as an organization. The entities that when we started developing our program, we had to think about all these particular organizations, agencies, institutions, legal, down to what does the landowner need to be successful on their land. Now, you may not find all, you may not start with having all of those individuals at the table. You may start with only three or four. By the end of the time that you finish working with landowners, bringing them into your fold, you'll end up knowing that you got to feel, put somebody in this box by a name because the landowners that we were dealing with in the program, they had many problems. They had many barriers. And so once we identified a barrier, we figured out what ways we can help the landowner become successful. So experiencing with landowners applying to NRCS, they had problems with the farm bill. They didn't know how we had, a, and we identified ways that we can help the farm bill get improved. So that was done for the 2018 farm bill. American Forestry Foundation leads that process now. Gave us a way to better track and identify and serve the air property owners. Because now we have a database and we were able to measure outcomes, not just saying clear title. We were talking about ways that how do we help the landowner know that they need a wheel. Uh, we talked about ways that they can clear title. Uh, most importantly, building out the family tree. There's no reason for a landowner to come to the table without a family tree because, one, you don't need to pay anybody to, to tell you who your family is. You do that before you start working with an attorney or working with anybody else because that's one of the most important critical steps in clearing up your title. The SFLR programs were created to address the need for more boots on the ground. So in order to do this work, we had to include the extension agencies at the land-grant university. 
we had to bring in other foresters or conservationists that are already out there working. We brought in RCS, the technical people that work for them in the field offices. All of us came together to say what's critical for the landowner. How do we make the landowner successful? So we had a, all, we all had a shared outcome. We didn't go in there fighting about we here to help, we here to take over. We really had to all come together and listen and create a plan for each landowner, one that was in the pilot, but beyond that, now one group that I work with, we started with 40 landowners in the pilot. They well over three, 400 landowners today. They started with six counties when I got there. I think they well over 20, up 20 counties now, serving this particular landowner group, but also helping to clear title. So there was a working group established in 2020, chartered in February of 2020, which is what part I'm part of that group and that we are working toward, I mean, to ensure that the unit, the air property, the unserved, historic unserved farmers and ranchers succeed through a responsible stewardship of resources. And they had a vision to ensure that those HUFRs are equipped with the conservation tools they needed. Here's a team, here's the team made up of that working group. Now, this working group, you can do the same thing in your area, create it, follow the model that I just presented to you, talk about what landowners you want to serve, how you want to serve it, and then build out your plan to help them. Don't go in trying to help yourself. It's all about helping the landowner. That group was also to increase visibility within the communities and help in RCS. They also increased access for the group to the understanding of NRCS program. They, go, they did mitigation on farm risks. You're gonna hear a lot about that. They may be unique in communities through technical systems and cost sharing. So they brought resources. They also helped to find money. They ensured the natural resource conservation and sustainable production on working lands was impact, impacted. This was the team I mentioned to you earlier and they developed a set of goals. We are now doing quite a bit of work under the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. That's who helped provide support for this project that we're doing with you today. They focus on solutions to challenges facing the rural and underserved communities. And they also connect those communities to the education, the tools and resources available through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it's an initiative. OPP facilitates partnerships and offers education and resources that fosters hope and opportunity, wealth creation and asset building. And they do this in rural and underserved communities. Several grants were provided either 2501 or CCP this year. And that's money on the ground to put more boots on the ground to help more landowners become successful and to ensure that the communities are working to tandem together. And the program is designed for the socially disadvantaged farmer and rancher which is the 2501 program, the beginning farmer and rancher development program. And these are the projects that I believe that were, fund, that were funded and under the percentage in the South, that's 39.4% for the 1890s. The Northeast had 182 of the 1862s. And some CBOs in North Central were a total of 100%. So I have time for about a few questions here, five minutes to two. Well, we have a little bit of time up until 2.15. Any questions? And please feel free to type those questions into the chat and we'll try to get those answered. I don't see the chat box. Do you see anything, Catherine? I do not, but we'll okay. let people we'll let people take a few minutes. It looks like we just got one in. Sam, are you seeing this um, from Aisha? Yep, now I see it. Oh, 
or warranty deeds a secure method of transferring land? That's one I cannot answer because I'm not an attorney. <laughs> So there's still no benefit from the farm bill? Well, financially, not yet. Uh, they are working toward some type of way to help, but it's all based on a loan program process now. But they are still working on the language, so there's not a lot I can tell you about it. But one of the things that's probably that's very helpful prior to this farm bill, the air property owners really didn't qualify to take advantage of what I consider the Environmental Quality Incentive Program nor were they able to uh, go and get financial assistance from NRCS. Now that qualification that allows them to show some type of ownership of the land or to bring a, to have access to the land from under the, that's what they call a lease of the land, they can qualify for NRCS programs and services and get and qualify for financial assistance. I am an attorney, and yes, a warranty deed transfer property, but you have to be an owner from a previous deed. Thank you. Is there a template for setting up the working group organization to assist landowners you can share? I will provide one not in this presentation, but it'll be associated with it that I can, I'll have it, I'll be able to provide it to the host group here. The programs we extended due to COVID-19. That I can't answer, but what I've been noticing and what I've been seeing from the programs that I've been working with, uh, the programs have been implemented virtually. Most of the people that have received the 2501s and I think the CCPs, those funds were allocated based on what the proposals, which meant they said they would be doing virtual work with landowners. So I don't think anybody has shut down completely. And you can still get out one-on-one -on, -one on the land now, meet with people. Uh, I'm a forester by trade. I work with people every day. I've never stopped my business here in NC State. We spend time doing stuff on virtual platforms, but we also go out and meet people, but we stay six feet apart. We wear masks and we operate. 